Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you this evening. Uh, my name is Petra Slinkard, and I am the Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Nancy B. Putnam Curator of Fashion and Textiles at the Peabody Essex Museum. Uh, the Peabody Essex Museum is thrilled to be partnering with the Salem Foam Fest in Salem, Massachusetts uh, for this particular event which uh, is the life and impact of Calendar Girl, Ruth Finley. And tonight we are in for a treat because we will be having a virtual, as you know, uh, Q&A with the film's director, writer, producer, producers, and one of Ruth's um, former employees. So if you give me just a moment, I'm going to share my screen and uh, walk you through a few images. One moment. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and throughout the program, I would like to encourage you to please uh, drop any questions that you might have uh, for our filmmakers in our chat. So part of the reason that we wanted to partner with the Salem Film Festival, and in particular, the makers of Calendar Girl, is that currently the Peabody Essex Museum has an exhibition on view, which is in its final week. On March 14th will be the final day for our current exhibition, Made It, The Women Who Revolutionized Fashion. And this was an exhibition that we did in partnership with the Kunstmuseum Den Haag in the Netherlands. Uh, and Made It uh, was mounted in part to commemorate the 2020 anniversary um, of the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, and that while this amendment guaranteed, uh, but um, granted, but not guaranteed women the right to vote, it also was an opportunity for us to look at the advancements that women made in fashion history, specifically uh, design history, as it paralleled the advancements that women made in our social history. Um, but one of the sub themes to our exhibition absolutely focused on the history and the emergence and the importance of retail uh, fashion journalism and also uh, the rise in popularity of fashion presentations. Uh, and that really is what takes us to this important conversation that centers around a woman by the name of Ruth Finley, who was an American businesswoman and the founder and publisher of the Fashion Calendar. And she was also a central figure in the American fashion industry. So to kick us off, I'm going to go ahead and play the trailer for the film for any of you who haven't had an opportunity to see it just yet. So one moment. Oh, before we do that, absolutely, I'm sorry. Uh, I should uh, introduce our panelists who are joining us today. So we're joined first by uh, Christian Brune, who is the director, producer, cinematographer, and um, documentary narrative filmmaker. In addition to directing Calendar Girl, he recently completed The Burning Child and an award-winning documentaries, Please Hold the Line, Second Me, and The Road Movie, um, which was a winner of the British National Film and TV Awards. He has also directed, produced, and written uh, Blue Gold, American Jeans, which was acquired by Netflix. Um, we're also joined by Mary Myers Hackley, who was a fashion calendar employee and an associate producer to this film. Hackley is a Louisiana native with a Bachelor of Arts in History from Louisiana State University and a minor in theater. She embarked on a career working for Ruth Finley at the Fashion Calendar, where she assisted, edited um, the calendar and covered events for Fashion International. Today, she works as a law journal coordinator for Louisiana Law Review and the LSU Journal of Energy Law and Resources. And finally, Natalie Nudell, who is the writer and producer. Uh, as the writer and producer of Calendar Girl, um, in addition, Nudell is a historian of fashion and textiles and serves as an adjunct assistant professor in the history of art um, at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Her publications include Ruth Finley's 
fashion calendar in the hidden history of American fashion, which was published by Bloomsbury in 2018. And she regularly contributes to academic publications on the history of American runway fashion. And finally, um, we'll be joined later in our program uh, by our special guest, Joe Green, who is one of Ruth Finley's um, three sons. So now I'm going to delight you with the trailer. One moment. the first one to think of the fashion calendar. She coordinated every major fashion show. Capture this 24-7, 52 weeks a year of business. Ruth was the first one to think of the fashion calendar. She coordinated every major fashion show. Thousands of events in a multi-billion dollar industry. You have to call Ruth. It's pretty amazing what she did. Through having like family and kids, she just kept going with her fashion calendar. Someone who was Oslot working behind the scenes. And that was rude. I always wanted to be a model. Not trying that. <laughs> fashion So in addition to the enigmatic figure in fashion, um, we also want to concentrate and remind everyone that, of course, Ruth was a very real person. Uh, she was a mother of three sons. She was a wife. Uh, and she was a loving family member. And some of the quotes that you see on the screen here are from, uh, were contributed to this program by her family. Um, and so before we get started, um, we saw a glimpse into Ruth's personal life. Uh, and the individuals that you see on the screen include fashion designer Jeffrey Banks, Fern Mallis, and Bill Cunningham, who of course just represent the caliber of um, individuals that Ruth was involved with in the fashion industry. And so without further ado, I'd like to ask our special guests to join us, um, Natalie, Christian, and Mary, and we'll begin our conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Natalie. Hi, Hi, Mary. Hi, Christian. Hi. Thank you hey, for Petra. being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, so congratulations. Uh, this this film has been a delight to engage with. Um, personally, I've watched it three times, uh, and I'm hoping that our audience has also had an opportunity to see it. Um, but if you haven't, you still have until March 14th. Uh, to view it through the Salem Film Fest. And um, I guess we'll begin by just sort of maybe giving us a little bit of background information as to how this film uh, came into light and, and how you got clued into it. Christian. Well, um, I was uh, introduced to Ruth through a friend who was a family friend of Ruth, um, one of the producers, Kate Del Pizzo. Um, and uh, and Natalie had done, well, you can talk about that, Natalie, but Natalie had done a, um, or I think Kate had met Natalie uh, um, on a panel about the fashion calendar. Um, so I was invited over by Kate Topizzo to go meet Ruth one morning at um, in her apartment and have coffee with her and uh, ended up being a many, many hours long coffee and uh, sort of hit it off. And, and I, I think that the um, the idea of the, the fashion aspect was really interesting to me, but trying to understand how you have a 70 year career, how to, what, what personality is that? What is a person who can sustain this and be this important and also have a incredible balance in her life was just really appealing to me. So I jumped in and then of course met Mary and met uh, Natalie and others around the calendar. Fantastic. And Natalie, how about you? When did you become aware of Ruth? So I actually became aware of Ruth a long time ago, around uh, 2013. I happened to find a Wall Street Journal article that was written about her um, in around 2012. It popped up in my Facebook feed. Um, I had always sort of realized someone must do the calendar, but didn't realize there was a person and she was named and it was very uh, much this very long legacy of running the calendar. And while I was in graduate school, we, me and a group of students in one of our classes decided to curate an exhibition on the history of New York Fashion Week. And I had remembered we must include some fashion calendars because all runway moments in New York fashion exist within those calendars. 
we had a great exhibition. We had at uh, NYU's AD Washington Square East Gallery, Ruth was generous enough to give us her time and come speak at our symposium. And then through happenstance where my professor, Tracy Yoshimura, who's also a producer on the film, was friends with Kate, who uh, Christian spoke about. Kate's mom was friends with Ruth's niece, Steffi in Baltimore. So it was just this really amazing circle of communication. And Kate really um, had the idea that someone should make a movie about Ruth. And so she brought us all together and here we are. Fantastic. Um, so we have uh, uh, one question um, that we can begin with. And I think Christian, maybe you hit on this uh, briefly, but what drew you to this particular story um, of all the subjects that you have covered as a filmmaker? Um, what drew you to this particular story? One word, Ruth. <laughs> um, I you know I had done in the past, I had done a film about blue jeans. Um, so, so I was, but sort of a little bit in, 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 in the fashion world and found that, that fascinating. Um, but it really, I mean, it really come down to, or came down to uh, Ruth personality and, and, and her impact. And like, there's something about the scale of things, right? She was so incredibly important um, and generous and also completely understated, right? And never, um, you know, the calendar just did what it's supposed to do. It didn't, you know, she didn't take advertisement and all that stuff. So I just thought that there was something incredibly human about it. The um, sort of the life that she lived and how that was done and just trying to figure it out and find out. And then, you know, we spent so much time with Ruth just sitting in her apartment and chatting and recording. And Excellent. Well, I mean, I think certainly from the standpoint of an audience member, you know, Ruth's, um, human spirit, her, her humanness, life, good life. you know, yeah. really came through in the way in which you captured her. And, mm -hmm. and Mary, I'm wondering, as someone who worked alongside of Ruth on a daily basis, um, you know, is that is that true to form? And can you tell us a little bit of what what your day to day was like uh, working uh, with Ruth on the fashion calendar? It's good. Um, <laughs> she's all of those things. Um, and I was looking at some of the qualities that, in the slideshow earlier. She never once raised her voice with me. Like she was the best boss ever, um, but she worked you up. <laughs> I worked hard, um, but it, really anybody who came into the office, she would give them a job to do. If they were coming to stay for any amount of time or just visit, she was like, oh, do this, file these, put these in order. And um, she was just amazing. Always on the go, wanted to go out and do things every single night. Um, she's just someone to, I don't know, a great role model. Well, and I think for people who maybe don't have as, as deep an understanding of the fashion industry, um, you know, one of the questions that I, I think someone might ask, even though I, I know, and we'll just say that this is of course not true, um, but, you know, upon first hearing of the, the calendar and, and what it means, you know, some people I think might be quick to dismiss it, right? It's just a calendar. Like how could it be that big a deal? Um, and yet of course it was a, a 24 hours a day, seven days a week job. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just give us a little bit more detail as to you know what the importance of the calendar was and what all went into managing it. Well, it kept track of things. It mainly, you know, I was talking to someone, a member of the press actually not too long ago who reminded me of the importance of, for the photographers at the runway shows they would always have the calendar to know that they may take so many photos in a day, but and all they would have, I guess, is a timestamp for their photos. So they could look in Ruth's calendar and always know which designer that was because some designers didn't necessarily have a backdrop with their name on it. So that's just like hundreds of photos. So it was really helpful to, I guess, not only the press, but you know, the buyers in ways probably that I can't think of now um, but she just kept track of it all. So it was like the central place that um, retailers could call or anyone having a new beauty product launch, bridal show, menswear, just all sorts of things, call and check to see what else is going on and, um, you know, what might compete with, with whatever it is you're trying to have. I don't know. Excellent. Thank you. Natalie, go ahead. I definitely have something to add in terms of the calendar. I think that you know, questioning how, what, is it still relevant or is it even important? I think right now, as we all know with the pandemic, 
the entire fashion calendar is under question. The CFDA ha has changed their initial approach that they took. And so what's so amazing, we've been making this film for years and it's like every six months it changes and it becomes more and more relevant because the fashion calendar is still one of the most relevant topics when it comes to fashion presentations in 2021. So Ruth's calendar is this amazing uh, representation of the longevity and also, you know, it's still really important today. So you brought up how long it took to make the film. Um, and that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask as well is, you know, that you're, you're focused really on this moment of transition in 2014. Um, and I'm wondering, did your, was the focus of the film initially to really, um, to hone in on that moment of transition as it represented Ruth's legacy? Uh, or was that something that was sort of serendipitous that came out of it? And then a, a double question to that is when you, um, either you or Christian approached Ruth about making the film, was she immediately uh, interested in participating or did it take a little bit of um, coaxing? Um, well, I know that it took a little bit of coaxing on Kate's part initially. Um, she eventually convinced Ruth and then brought in uh, Christian to meet her and all of these things. But um, I think it was serendipitous, really. I think when Kate initially even approached Ruth, we didn't realize that she was, you know, selling her the calendar to the CFDA or that acquisition was happening. And so uh, we were really lucky in our timing. Great. Right, so got right. I also, just a little additional, so I, I think it was because we happened to be there in those last couple of weeks when the office was open, I think there was some sense of urgency in a way, right? And, and Natalie, we talked about it, that, that Ruth also, there was like, she was she was sort of ready to share her stories, right? I feel like she had not done that a lot. Um, so it just, it just seemed like you said it was the right time. Excellent. Well, and so we've got a couple of questions coming in that I want to address, but before we do that, I was very impressed with the the amount of footage that you were able to get and um, the number of people who you engaged in the making of the film. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit as a as a director, Christian, you know, what all did it take <laughs> to be a part of Fashion Week, uh, to be able to get that behind the scenes footage? Um, and you know, walk us through that process a little bit. Well, it was obviously great fun to be to be able to to um, to be taken backstage at all the the fashion shows with Ruth. Um, and I think and, and you, everybody lined up. I don't think Mary helped us a lot with this, but I think just the access and then anytime there was, if there was an email from Mary or from Ruth to any designer, they would. Everybody said yes, of course. We would love to do this, right? She's someone we all respect, someone that we all love. Um, she deserves the film, and so yeah, everybody, everybody showed up. Everybody signed on with no questions or hesitation. Really. Um, so this is a, this is an extension of a question um, from Beth, uh, and the question is, why was Ruth so uh, resistant to leveraging technology to manage and share the calendar? Um, and I'll just, I'll add uh, uh, my own sort of take on that as well, because when I was watching it and I was trying to describe what I was seeing with somebody, it sort of, it sort of brought to mind that phrase, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> and I think that we started to see that a little bit. So I don't know if Mary, um, you have anything to, to add for that, but, you know, was Ruth outwardly resistant or was it more just part of her practice? I think, you know, I think before I started working with her, there was, there were people trying to encourage her to go online with the uh, calendar. Um, and she did once, I mean, eventually <laughs> I started and then uh, we just pushed her and kept pushing for better websites. And we finally had a really good one. And I don't think that she was all that resistant to it. I really don't. She... <laughs> She did pretty well for someone in her age. I mean, actually, I don't. I never saw age when I looked at Ruth. Um, I just saw like life and her spirit and everything. But she had an iPhone. I mean, she wasn't perfect with the iPhone, but like, I don't. I don't never thought her as being resistant. I don't know, but others in the industry did. 
So this is a question maybe for you or for Natalie. Um, and this is also from Beth. And the question is, what kept someone else from swooping in uh, to do so before the eventual CFDA purchase of the business? Is that for me? Or well, I know that, well, we bring it up in the film, right? She had received many uh, uh, offers to, um, you know, acquire her business, et cetera. And I know Mary could speak to that as well. And she, she that she resisted. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And there were a couple of people that tried to, but go ahead. Sorry. No, but I think it also brings, you no, know, that brings into point what you were saying earlier, because I think Ruth was so at the center of it, and I think she felt a great responsibility. Um, so the fact that, I think when it was supposed to go online, or there was supposed to be an app, and even when it was handed over, in the beginning to the CFDA, that there was a thought that the sort of brave new world, that everything is just automated, that you just walk on and people do it themselves, and it's all going to work itself out. But turns out that that's really not that easy. And, and I think it became clear afterwards just how key Ruth was and Mary, like that there was somebody there to pick up the phone and resolve all these uh, issues that, that came up. Um, so I just think it's that, I think it's like, she just probably felt that she had to be at the center of it, right? The fact that it was all printed in the office and it was very yeah, controlled it made it and accessible. very personal. Yeah, it made it accessible for her and she was used to it. It was her process and it was the same for all of those years, like with the box, her contacts and everything, but right. oh, yeah, the little, the, so. yeah, Word. no, and, and I think, to, and just to sort of follow up on the same point, I think there's something to the idea of um, that she, you know, somebody in the film says she was a disruptor when she started, right? She really made a huge, huge difference in the fashion industry, and this is it for 70 years. So, so the fact that there's sort of that people like questioning why she didn't just continue and why it had to change, like she built something that eventually outgrew what she had created and it just had to become something else. I don't think there's a solution like mm -hmm. Natalie was saying. Everybody's still trying to figure out how do you schedule all this and how do you maybe not have one person be that hub, but make it a little more open, but also you can't just have it be completely open because you do need that, whatever that human touch is that mm -hmm. people can talk and find out how to you know, solve things. So. And it grew so fast in the last few years. Like it was unbelievable. If you looked at the grids for fashion week, like right when I started and then by the time the business was sold, it just doubled the amount of shows and events. I mean, well, yeah, I was going to say there's only, there's an economy of space there. <laughs> you can only yeah. fit so many names in one, in one rectangle. Um, <laughs> but I think that that also speaks to another point that you really draw out in Ruth's history in the film is that part of her appeal and part of, I think, the, the appeal of the calendar was that it was very democratic in its approach, that she wasn't, you know, as one of the designers, I think, says, or one of the representatives of a designer says, you know, she had no skin in the game. So it wasn't about playing favorites. It wasn't necessarily about, you know, trying to um, one-up anyone, but it was truly about sort of fostering, um, a sense of collegiality, I think, are among the designers and also, um, you know, providing space and support for emerging designers in, in par with, or on par with designers who were established. Absolutely. And that's what's so amazing about the fashion calendar. You could be an emerging nobody that's putting on your first show and right below you, you'll have a listing for the most important designer of that season because it's all chronological. And again, the calendar is so important to structure fashion because it's ultimately an entire industry based on time, right? Seasons and, you know, collections and being passe or avant-garde. It's really in so many ways about time. And I think, um, you know, for those of you who have heard recently the CFDA renamed their fashion calendar American designer showings and ultimately went back to an approach more similar to Ruth, where they're really just going to represent American designers all year around and list everything. Because after Ruth sold the calendar, it became quite fragmented. And, and I think there is a value of one centralized place. 
So this is a question um, that is addressed a little bit in the film, uh, but maybe we could go into a little bit more background information. And it's, can you talk about how Ruth first got started working on the calendar? Um, and was it during the first New York Fashion Week? Well, what I know is that Ruth and uh, two colleagues of hers, Francis and Alice Hughes, who were already quite advanced in the fashion industry and had careers, one at uh, Mademoiselle, the other at King Syndicated Press, I think. And they got together and developed the calendar. But I think at the beginning, we know the calendar was not really catching on because essentially Eleanor Lambert had not started Press Week. And once Press Week developed and we have this uh, snowball of American fashion in the post-war period, we see the fashion calendar really cementing its place in American fashion. We know that Ruth, um, soon after the beginning of the calendar, uh, of the business essentially took it over um, and took full control from Alice and Francis Hughes and continued on this, you know, really lean overhead, trying to make it work as this young woman in New York. And um, she does say that the business and her place in American fashion and the importance of the fashion calendar was really most solidified in the 1970s when you see the beginning of American ready to wear um, become very important globally. So I think the first decades of the calendar um, were, um, you know, like any young business, really just, you know, try to make it work. So this is a question for Mary. Um, what was it like to witness the evolution of the calendar to the juggernaut that it has become today? Well, do you mean that this, the sale of the business? <laughs> well, I think maybe just the rise in success and 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 just how big and um, sort of all consuming it had become. Um, I don't know. I I, don't, I never from that point of view, I never really thought about it. It's just a job. That <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that question because then it starts. You know, when it was sold, everything changed. Mm. Well, I another, can't really, another I can't really speak to that, like, because then I had to stop working on the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> well, another question that was posed for you is, you know, when did you begin working on the calendar, and for how many years did you work with Ruth? I um, moved to New York um, September one, two thousand one, and I started. Well, I took another job first downtown, but I. <laughs> couldn't do that anymore. So I replied to an ad in the New York Times and got the job working for Ruth. Um, it just said office admin with some editorial must like cats. And I was like, oh, wait, I can do these things. <laughs> so I sent in my resume and they called me for an interview. And I kind of knew after that first interview that I think I'm going to get this job. And I did. And so I started January 1 or well, not the first, but like, I guess, shortly after the second or third, probably of 2002. And I worked there right up until the transition and through the transition at the CFDA, I was, um, I guess I, I don't know, I worked there during the transition and then for another year in their finance department at the CFDA. And then I moved back to Louisiana. Thank you. Um, Christian, Two questions. Uh, one is that this is sort of a, a sort of a clarification point of clarification. But when Ruth leaves the office, that scene where she's you know turning off the light and leaving the office, um, that was the first time that it dawned on me that it that it could have been an apartment, <laughs> an apartment building. Is that correct? That the office was in an apartment. That is, that is correct. It was. Yes. <laughs> was that a savvy business move? I was wondering. If that was a, a New York, uh, a New York real estate uh, move, yeah, I, mean, it's, I guess so. I think it was a condo. Ruth okay. bought the office. Yeah, right. right That's right. fantastic. Um, and then the other question that I have for you, Christian, is of course, you know, there were 
Ruth invited you into her home. You know, she, she invited you into, you know, her personal intimate life. We get to meet Joe, um, not Joe, her son, but Joe, her boyfriend in the film. And, you know, was that something that she was very, uh, you know, forthcoming with, um, or did also, did that take a little bit of coaxing? And I'm wondering, you know, how much footage you also had to, to go through in the, in the editing process to, to get the film to be, you know, what you wanted it to be. Um, she was, um, Ruth was very forthcoming. I think, I think once we started filming, she just completely opened up, right? Natalie, there was like nothing like her wardrobe, her home. We were there like all the time with lights and cameras and tripods and things. And, and when we went to visit Joe Siegel, I just thought she just, it was just part of her life and she brought us along. So everything was quite effortless and which also meant that we ended up having, you know, hundreds of hours of, of footage, which took us a few years to edit and actually to find, just to get to the core of it and get the story and sort of find a, a structure that in some ways, you know, tells the story, the, the, the fashion history, but also gets in and really sort of, you get to feel who Ruth was. Um, and I wanted to say one thing from your question earlier, like, you know, running around to, to fashion weeks with, with uh, Ruth. And it was just incredible. But the best part was that you would, anywhere you would go, all the security guards and all the people that they just all knew her. So it's like, hey, Ruth, oh, Ruth. It was like, it's like a nonstop love fest of uh, running around. It was, it was just a very special time. Sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. One of my favorite parts in the film, I think I, I've forgotten who she, the, the name of the gentleman who she was speaking with. Um, but he's talking about, you know, how it doesn't matter what kind of party it is, whether it's, you know, a sophisticated party in the afternoon, or if it's like a downtown party at, you know, midnight. And he said, Oh, well, I had to go to bed. It was midnight. And she says, Well, that's not that late. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like that's that, it, you know, <laughs> not knowing her, I felt like that kind of summarized the, that vitality that, you know, Natalie and Mary are, are speaking about. The editor of Paper Magazine, thank you. That's, yes, that's exactly who it is. Yes, um, right. And so I guess one other question that I have about the making of the film is, you know, you said you had hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage. You know, is there anything that didn't make it into the film that you really wish, like, Darn, if we only had, you know, two more hours to tell this story. I think more great fashion history and just more uh, history um, would have been fun. Um, but I don't think there's anything that we didn't get, right? I think there's nothing, nobody said no. Um, I think initially there was, um, there was, I think just structurally in the beginning, we thought that maybe the, the, the sale of the calendar and the, CFJ had taken over was was it like a very dramatic kind of thing, and I think for Ruth it was a huge deal to her. Um, so I think initially we thought it was probably more dramatic than it turned out to be, um, because I think once we did start filming, everybody again was on board, and the CFJ was really great and forthcoming and helping out and showing off for interviews, and so I think that. So I think the drama in that sense was played down a little bit. And also it gave us the room to really, again, like sort of circle around Ruth in various setups. So there's like Ruth um, as a family person, there's Ruth as a calendar girl, and then there's Ruth as uh, the mentor in the fashion industry. So just like many different views on Ruth is really what we settled on, I think, which, which we're all pretty happy, very happy that we did. Fantastic. We were so incredibly lucky to have such wonderful um, interviewees. Like we have three hours of um, Stan Herman that could be a fashion documentary in and of itself. So if, if only we could have added more of the personalities, but we had to make a, a 72 minute film. <laughs> so I know that you are, um... You know, this is your New England debut at the Salem Film Fest. You have, uh, I think, shown at the, the New York Documentary Film Fest. Um, you know, how has the reception to the film been? Uh, and what are you, what are you looking uh, forward to in the future as the film continues to gain traction? Well, I think the best part is that people, everybody seems to fall in love with Ruth, which is the best part of it. Um, and also, I think we were consistently sort of one of the top movies in at Doc NYC, which was 
a huge honor and just, uh, and then we get to screen it with you guys and, and work with great institutions and fashion. And I think that's a journey. That's that festival, film festival journey of independent film. You just get to, you know, talk to and other people who care about the same things and travel. Hopefully we can travel again next year. That's, <laughs> that's the one thing, the one thing that has changed. So that hopefully that'll open up soon. And Natalie, is this your first film that you've worked on? Oh yes, absolutely. I came at right out of graduate school. Uh, when I, after I made the exhibition with Ruth, the academic in me wanted to do an oral history. The idea of a documentary was really not on my radar, but it was a really interesting experience going from like writing a thesis and doing something extremely isolated to working on a crew with many different people with many different types of, um, you know, assets and train and, you know, specialties. And so, yes, it was the first time I worked on a film and um, it was, it was a really great experience. To, to Natalie's great credit, I will say that we, we, um, I had to come off another film that was a, like a big production with lots, lots and lots of people around. So this was really like many, many times it was just Natalie and myself, you know, carrying heavy camera bags and tripods and lights and really just setting everything up. But what it did do is that we did create this sort of very intimate atmosphere, I think, for all of the, both the interviews with designers and of course with Ruth, that, it, that you know, we didn't, you know, we worked with lots of great people, but we didn't show up with like 15 people all staring at Ruth while she was trying to tell her story. It was very, very, um, yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of heavy things to carry around, right, Natalie? <laughs> oh, yeah. And some of the fashion week was in winter, I think. I think we went to one of the oh, yes. fashion weeks yes. in winter. So, and Perfect. at one point, Christian was even in like the photographer pit, like with the other fashion photographers oh, who right. are like that's fighting right. for right. images and he's trying to get the runner. <laughs> it was really, it was, <laughs> was really pretty fun. Hardcore, and, too. Yeah, it was. It was pretty brutal. Like people were like, that's like they had their spot and nobody gets in their way. And like, I didn't know. I just kind of tried to find a spot and everybody was like, kicking me around looked kind of funny. Oh, that's great. Um, so one of the key moments at the end of the film is when um, the office is packed up uh, to be acquired by um, FIT Library and Archives. And Natalie, I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about that. I mean, it, from looking at the film, it was hard to see how much material was collected, but was it truly the entire contents of the the calendar girl office was it all of Ruth's personal correspondence um was it strictly just the calendars so Ruth the Ruth Finley collection as you say now lives at special collections and college archives at the Fashion Institute of Technology and when she packed up her office I know that like in the history of her offices with like moves and floods and all kinds of stuff there were things lost along the way but the bulk of the collection are the entire archives of her three main publications, which was Fashion Calendar, which as we know, ran um, from the early 1940s until 2014. Fashion, uh, Fashion International, which was a newsletter that was added to Fashion Calendar from the mid seventies until I think it was 2008. And we know Mary also wrote for that publication. And then also a very little known publication called home furnishings calendar, which was in the exact same format as fashion calendar. After a few years after they got it going, they mm -hmm. had um, decided to do another publication for this nascent field called home decorating and you know interior mm -hmm. design. And so they did it for, I think about four or five years. So that all of that um, amounts to about, it's about 24 to 25 linear feet. It's around 55,000 pages. There are a few boxes of correspondence, some, you know, um, ephemera and material from, you know, Ruth, more than just the calendar, she was on so many boards, the New York City, you know, ex uh, fashion executive circle, fa uh, fashion group international, like every um, executive organization she was very much part of. So a lot of that material as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think our, our final question before we invite Joe on is from Sabrina, who this is to all of you. Um, what does fashion mean to you? And what do you think that it meant for Ruth? Uh, Mary, why don't we start with you? Fashion, what does fashion mean to me? I love it. I mean, this year has changed a little, but <laughs> something that 
fashion makes you feel good. It's what makes you feel good and confident. And that's what it's all about. And I think it was for the same for Ruth. And she loved designers and clothes and you know, she loved the shows. Great. Christian, how about you? Well, I think design is incredibly important. And I think it obviously fashion design is how we present ourselves to the world. And so yeah, I, I find it exciting and interesting, and cool. Um, and I know it was important to Ruth. I mean, the, from what we saw in filming, again, filming her wardrobe since she kept all the all the pieces she's gotten from designers over the years. And it meant, it meant everything to her. And like that guy in the film says, sorry, not that guy, but losing my memory here, but uh, uh, that, you know, she never tired, right? She loves, she loves, loves, loves fashion. She would, she never stopped every fashion week, even to the very end, she just, kept going to all the shows. So yeah. fashion was very important to Ruth. Well, and I love that part of the film too. I mean, it, it's subtle when she's, you know, pulling ob um, dresses from her closet and she's sort of figuring out what she's going to wear because she wants to support the designers by wearing what, what you know, who, who she's going to see. And yeah. I felt like that also just reinforced um, that notion of what a cheerleader she was for all of the people that she supported. And that it wasn't just, you know, them investing in the calendar, but it was equally her investing in them. And it was how she got to know, you know, what, what, what they did, mm -hmm. and how their exactly. design differed from the others and, and that helped in the scheduling and all of it. But yeah, go ahead. No, that's, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and Natalie, uh, how about you? What does fashion mean for you? And what do you think it meant for Ruth? Well, I completely agree with um, every, all of the statements here, but I definitely agree that for Ruth, fashion was clothing, but it was also community. And she, her legacy in American fashion was so long, her longevity, you know, trounced so many other people that she truly um, had this amazing perspective on the people involved, the industry at play. And I think she saw her position in it. She thought the industry is extremely important and the community it, of the fashion industry was ex extremely important, you know, especially at the beginning, it was like, you know, a shtetl in the garment district that essentially developed into something really global. But she, um, it was so much about the people for her. And I think for me, fashion, at, you know, as you know, I'm a fashion and textile historian. So it's, what I do for a living in terms of thinking about, but it's identity, it's politics, it's eco economy, it's culture, it's what we project and what we want people to see or not see or deceive or any of these things. But I also think it's a multi-trillion dollar industry that also ha you know, is so um, interdisciplinary. It goes into so many different fields and that's why, you know, as you know, Petra, I don't have to convince you that it is the most, you know, um, it is the zeitgeist of the culture, ultimately. You know, when somebody looks at 2020, they're gonna want, they're not, it's not gonna take them very long to figure out why so many new patterns for sweatpants were developed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, this actually, I'm gonna pose this question to Mary and this is from Lisa and it says, Ruth lives such a full, active and busy life. Uh, how much sleep did she get at night? <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> I don't know. She went out almost every night. I would think she probably went to bed on an average, probably around 10 or 11, 10 or 11. Sometimes later, depending on like, even I would go with her to things and we would get home so late. <laughs> every now and then like she would turn her chair around in the office and like I know <laughs> I know what she was doing with her back face like <laughs> she's taking it oh that's fantastic well and I think with that um I'd like to invite Joe Green on uh who's our, our special guest this evening um Joe if you're there you can turn your camera on and uh unmute yourself and Joe, uh, hello. It's nice to Hi. see you. Hi, how are you? A very interesting, great, great panel. Oh, well, you know, we, we owe it to our filmmakers um, for making this beautiful film about your mom and for sharing their stories with us. Um, so, you know, Mary kind of gave us a little bit of a glimpse in, in Ruth's sleeping patterns in her later life. And I'm wondering <laughs> if you can tell us a little bit about 
her sleeping patterns as a, as a young working mother? Well, as an early life, she was very, very conscious of keeping the business separate from family. So I would come home from elementary school and she would always make me lunch. And she'd be on the phone with Calvin Klein, setting up a show at the same time as making a lunch. And um, she tried to always do the motherly thing. And, uh, you know, there were people who tried to uh, do a fashion show without listing a fashion calendar. And she said, yeah, go ahead, try. And <laughs> that was the last time they would try once. And then they, they realized there was nobody coming because fashion, she had like a monopoly on it. And uh, there was a lot of pressure on her to take ads, to take advertisement. And she, she could have made a lot more money and that was a big issue we had. Um, and uh, she said, no, I'm not taking any ads. I don't care. I don't want any, uh, in, any indication that there was any you know, partiality to anybody. So she's she, you know, very, very uh, shows about that, but no show would go on without being in the fashion calendar. And uh, she would you know, separate business as much as possible. And as Christian said, she had a office in an adjacent in a separate part of the house and bought the condo there but it was she could walk into the outside the office and get to the rest of the residence oh i didn't realize that they were connected, they were connected. i thought they were in separate buildings oh no. that makes a lot of sense in okay the beginning, in the beginning see in the okay. be after she moved then it was different but in the beginning it was connected and she didn't want anybody to know that it was connected so she <laughs> And this was before, you know, video and, uh, you know, so she would talk to Calvin Klein in the kitchen while she was making lunch when I came home for lunch. Um, well, and I, <laughs> I love the part in the film where she talks about um, going to the hospital to, to deliver a child <laughs> and that no one even knew that she was in the hospital because right. she just packs up her work and takes it with her. And I think that that really, you know, speaks to her. Um, you know, one thing I want to point out for anyone who hasn't seen the film, you know, it's not just that Ruth was a, was a working mother. It's that she was a single working entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really, you know, with three sons to raise that, you know, it seems like she's done a wonderful job. And there is a moment in the, in the film where it really, you know, hones in on the fact, as you just said, that she, you know, was so committed to her family and that she did keep it separate. Um, but that there's a great tenacity to her personality. And, and you shared with me a story about, uh, some takeout that um, I thought was a, a pretty good example of that kind of tenacity that she had in her. Yeah. Oh, do you want me to share that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. She didn't like to be taken advantage of. And in fact, in the business, there were times in the beginning where uh, she would be on the phone and they'd say, well, let me talk to the person in charge. <laughs> and, she, and someone else would get on. She'd, she'd change her voice and she'd get on this. Yes. You know, <laughs> What would you like? You know, I'm in charge. <laughs> Nobody could believe that she this was that. Mary. No one could believe that this was, you know, a woman was running this business. It just wasn't done. Uh, and uh, yeah, so she would, she would actually disguise her voice and say, I'm in charge. It was, it was just, you know, she'd say, hold on a minute, I'll get the person. <laughs> you know, Mary's on it. That's so, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, because, you know, there was, you know, nobody had a woman in charge of the business. Women were supposed to stay home and have babies. And uh, that's about it. But uh, yeah, the story about the, she didn't like to be taken advantage of. So my brother uh, reminded me of the, uh, uh, the tradition uh -huh. at a Sunday night dinner where we went to the Chinese restaurant, Sun Ya on 77th and 3rd, maybe 40 to 50 times a year. And every time my brother, uh, one brother would, Consist, his dinner would consist of fried outer shells of egg rolls doused in duck sauce. That's all he ate. Uh, his, one Sunday night, one of us was sick, so we had to have our food delivered from Sunya rather than going there. When the order arrived, Ruth was furious that there was an extra charge for the large quantity of duck sauce that Jim required. Did she yell at the delivery man? Absolutely not. The next Sunday, we went to Sonia as usual, but this time she was armed with an empty plastic gallon-sized container in a shopping bag. She sat down with the open jar on the floor between her feet and proceeded to order at least 100 of the little dishes of duck sauce, one after another, and didn't stop until her gallon jar was full. I, uh, I don't know what the waiters were thinking. 
And the fact that the jar was untouched for our in our refrigerator for about five years didn't bother her at all. Just <laughs> it was a little monument to her tenacity. So she wouldn't, she hated to be taken advantage of in any way. Um, but so that's that's the story about the Sanya uh, duck sauce that was in the refrigerator for five years. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, and I love the fact that you just shared with us the story that she would change her voice when someone would ask who was in charge, because in the film, there's a moment where she says, you know, I began so young yeah. that, you know, I had a voice on the phone. No one ever really saw me in the beginning. And they, they assumed that I was much older than I was. And then of course her stature, um, you know, that's another point. I think Ralph Rucci discusses this in the film where he's like, you know, it doesn't matter who's bulldozing their way to the front, you know, Ruth found a way to sort of maneuver her way in just to offer her congratulations and to say, you know, hello. And I think that that's a really beautiful testament, again, to her tenacity. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. I mean, no, you know, people couldn't believe that this young person was uh, in charge of the business and no show went on with, without being listed in fashion calendar at the time. And some people tried and just once. And then they would come back. <laughs> and she yeah. said, go ahead, try. Uh, but every show listed in there. No, no show was done without being listed in fashion calendar. That's uh, fantastic. Yes, she had that in the beginning, you know, some young, you know, girl right out of college. They couldn't believe it. So she put on a separate voice. <laughs> yeah, and she didn't want them to be the same person who answered the phone. Right, so, exactly. She would answer it a lot. And she that's, would... that's exactly oh. right too. She didn't want to be the same person to answer the phone. I love that. I mean, the creativity and just also the wherewithal, you know, I mean, this is clearly a woman who understood business um, and understood, you know, how to get ahead without, uh, you know, taking advantage of anyone without ever, you know, just, I think it's really, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. We had, um, to, convince her to, uh, we had to convince her to sell to CFDA. She didn't want to sell. She said, if you turn down many, many uh, offers of money for buying the business, many, many. And she said, oh no, this is a family business. Well, she had no daughters, number one. Um, and uh, we had to convince her that we weren't gonna do the business. We weren't gonna take off, we had other things in mind. And we had to actually convince her to sell. She was, she didn't wanna sell. This is a you know family business, we're not selling. Well, good for her. She's definitely a woman mm -hmm. who stuck to her guns. Yeah. Um, so as we're winding down, I just want to make sure if there are any other additional questions that anyone would like to drop in, um, I'm happy to, to address those. And, you know, if not, then I just want to say thank you um, to our panelists, Natalie, Christian, Mary, and Joe as our, as our special guest and especially to the, the Salem Film Fest for hosting this fantastic documentary and um, for making it available to us. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, Christian. Um, would you like to close this out? Well, I just wanna thank you. I just wanna thank you and thank everybody. And it's so fun to see everybody again, uh, even just on Zoom. And I haven't seen Joe in so long. It's great to see you. Yes. Uh, you. So it's good. The family is back here, I like it, it's good. So we do have one more question that just came in. This is from Kendall and it's uh, for Christian. Are you working on any new projects? So I guess it would be good to know what all of you, what, what's next for all of you? Um, I am working on a bunch. I just, we just premiered a film that I produced with Spike Lee called Son of the South. That's out in theaters and streaming. Um, and I'm working and developing a, a feature film about Candy Darling, the oh, Andy Warhol cool. muse. Mm. Uh, so that's super exciting. We're very close to being ready with that. Um, and I'm doing another documentary uh, on the art world. So fashion and now the art world, uh, also of a wonderful woman in her 90s. So there you go. Fantastic. Natalie, how about you? What's next for you? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. So what's on right now, the library um, at FIT, Special Collections, and Karen Trevet, the, the head of Special Collections there, and I are working on a project to hopefully uh, uh, work on some sort of digitization of the archive, but um, we are 
still in the uh, funding stages. So we're hoping to get there soon. Fantastic. Thank you. And Mary, how about you? We know that you've, you've moved to Louisiana. Are you happy in your new role? Um, it's fine for now. Excellent. We'll see. I'm working on some other things. Um, it's part time job, but I'm in your family. So that's good and needed right now. Um, but we'll see. I don't think it's my final um, stop on the career. Track. You miss New York? Actually, I do, but we'll see. So we haven't seen the last of you yet. <laughs> <We're> not. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you to all of our guests who joined us this evening. And again, if you haven't seen the film, you still have a few more days left to stream it through the Salem Film Fest. Um, and in addition to this documentary, there are so many wonderful documentaries that the festival is um, promoting and supporting and um, screening uh, when they officially kick off, which I believe is next week. So this is a kind of a precursor uh, that was done in um, honor of the exhibition. And again, thank you all for your time and for your talent and for sharing this beautiful story of this amazing woman with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you for you. having us. Thank You're you welcome. So much. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Petra and Bethany. And Corey. Yeah. Yes, everybody, the whole team. So much fun. There he is. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Excellent. Man. Okay, so we see, oh, Very March good. 19th through the 28th is the fest. I'll just say it, say it out loud. <laughs> um, excellent. Well, thank you all again and have a good evening. Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.